evening. Glad to be in the house of God. I trust that you are. Ooh, it's kind of loud. Turn me down, Bill. Turn me down. Turn me down. Turn me down, if you will. All right. All right. Um, I tell you what. Can you go ahead and turn me down a little bit more? I don't care. Yeah. Just still hot. Good, better, good. Am I too loud for you guys? Yeah. Good now? I'm so, fine. Yeah. <laughs> All right, we're going to turn the lights out, and we're going to get started in just a minute. And uh, where's my, my uh, no, lightsaber? Okay. And uh, we're going to get started here in just a minute. But uh, I, um, I wanted to share something with you. And, and um, mm, no, I'll wait. I'll wait. Let's just go ahead and jump in. We're going to have a word of prayer. Jump in. Grab your Bibles. Turn to Isaiah chapter number 19. Samuel, uh, no, I'll tell you what, uh, Tucker, you're right there. Go go get those lights for me, please. Uh, and uh, we're going to jump right in, just have a little bit of fun tonight. And then I'm going to go eat my weight in pizza. I'm joking about that too, by the way. No, not my full weight, just a quarter of the weight. Uh, all right, go ahead, brother, keep going. We're going dark tonight. The light switches, son, turn them down. <laughs> well, basically, you go, go, son, every light switch in the room, turn it down. There you go. Keep going, keep going, keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. Keep going. All right, there you go. Man, what a sarcastic church you are. Good uh, I tell you what, Brother Rich, lead us in a quick word of prayer, and then uh, we're going to jump right in. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the opportunity to be in your house tonight, Lord. I just pray now that you bless this time. Give the pastor wisdom, give us ears to hear, and hearts to change. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, look at uh, Isaiah chapter number 19. We're going to be talking about the pyramids. Now, when I'm talking about the pyramids, I'm specifically talking about the pyramids on the Giza Plain. There are pyramids all around the world. We'll get to that in just a moment. And there are numerous pyramids in Egypt. But we're talking about a specific set of pyramids, three pyramids. The central one is the pyramid in the Giza Plain. And in Isaiah chapter number 19, notice verse number, if you Isaiah 19, verse number 19. In that day shall there be an altar to the Lord in the midst of the land of Egypt and a pillar at the border thereof to the Lord. Now, I want you to look at that number 20 again. And it shall be for a sign, for a witness unto the Lord of hosts in the land of Egypt. And they shall cry unto the Lord because of the oppressor, and he shall send them a Savior, and a great one, and he shall deliver them. Verse number 19, look at it again. There shall be an altar to the Lord in the midst of the land of Egypt, and a pillar at the border thereof to the Lord. Now, I'm going to talk to you for a few moments tonight about what I think is the monument of the gods. I don't think our thing is uh, working. There we go. All right. Did you do that or me? You did that. Oh, cool. All right. I've got a new handy-dandy thing here, and uh, so we're going to try it. We're going to be talking about the monuments to the gods. Exodus, uh, Isaiah chapter number 19 said, now listen, the video, don't worry about the video. Uh, if you, I'm going to move around tonight, tonight, so just get it what you can. Um, Exodus, or, uh, Isaiah chapter 19 states that there's a monument in the midst of Egypt. One of the things that's important to understand about the geography of Egypt is Egypt was divided into two, two halves. There was Upper Egypt, which is actually in the lower part, and there was Lower Egypt, which is actually in the upper part. One of the very interesting things about the pyramid, the Great Pyramid in the, on the plains of Giza, is that it is located exactly dead center in that region of Egypt. In other words, if you're looking at the center between Upper and Lower Egypt, you're going to come across this great pyramid. Brother Kevin, if you'll go to the next slide for me. The Bible says in Jeremiah, great in counsel and mighty in work, for thine eyes are upon all the ways of the sons of men, to give everyone according to his ways and according to the fruit of his doings, which has set signs, and notice this phrase here, wonders in the land of Egypt, and notice that phrase, even unto this day. Now let that verse sink in just a minute for you here. Jeremiah is prophesying and preaching. He says, For thine eyes are upon all the ways of the sons of men, and according to the fruit of his doings. Now watch. Which hast set signs and wonders in the land of Egypt. Signs and wonders in the land of Egypt, 
And Jeremiah said, they're there even unto this day. All right? Next slide, if you will. When you're thinking about the pyramid, one of the things that's very important to understand is that when you're talking about the pyramid, when we think of pyramid, what's the first thing that comes to our mind? It's, it's Egypt. But one of the profound things about the pyramidic structure is that you find it globally. That's what makes it a very, very amazing thing. You find it globally in Iran, other places in Egypt, in Iraq. You find it in Nubia, a beautiful pyramid there. None of them are as great as the big pyramid, nor as large as the great pyramid, but you find them everywhere. You find them in uh, Chacona, you find them in Mexico, Cambodia, China. They are everywhere. The pyramidic structure is something that is universal and to, to archaeology, which is very, very fascinating because that tells you something. That tells you that in Mexico, here, the Pyramid of the Sun, they're on the other side of the world than Egypt. And yet, when they're building their temples, or what we believe to be their temples, they're building them in exactly the same structure that the Egyptians did. It is a global phenomenon. Now, you'll find that there are pyramids around the world. I'm going to show you a couple here. This is the one we were just speaking about up in Mexico. You can see, and again, you'll see in just a moment, all of these are, are much smaller than the Great Pyramid. Here is one in Peru, Guatemala. This is a fascinating one here in Bosnia. They believe that to be a pyramid. Now, uh, humanists say, no, 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 that's just a mountain. But mountains aren't cut at right angles. I believe that that's a pyramid, and I think that, well, I won't get into that right now. We'll get into that a little bit later. Here in the Sudan, and of course, let's not forget Bass Pro Shop in Memphis, Tennessee. <laughs> so the pyramid is everywhere. When you pull out your money, what are you going to find? Pyramid. You're going to find the pyramid. When you go to the Louvre, you'll find a design of the pyramid. That pyramidic structure is global. And when you go back into archaeology, what you find is the further you go back in archaeological studies, the more unified, this is very important, the more unified the archaeology is, the architecture is. All of these people at a certain date in past were building something very, 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 very similar. All of them were pyramidic in structure. Now, this is a video that we're going to show you. They are very, very particular about the Great Pyramid. It's hard to give you bare facts and figures. I can give you some bare facts and figures, and I will in just a moment, but it's hard for you to really understand and grasp how big and mammoth it is. Well, this guy got the idea of climbing the pyramid. Now, lest you want to try to do the same thing, he spent quite a long time in jail for this. He had all of his phone and video equipment confiscated. They are very particular about you doing this. First of all, they don't want copycats. Second of all, I'll see if you catch it, there's something that stands out if you understand what you're looking at once you get up and he pans across. There's something that, that's very poignant. We'll get to it later on in the presentation. But he had a redundancy. And what happened was, is even though they confiscated all his video, he was streaming that video and he was able to save it. And what you're about to see, with some beautiful music to go along with it, uh, what you're about to see is him climbing the Great Pyramid, and it's going to give you a bird's eye view of what it looks like, and then I'll come back and give you some bare facts of what the arch architecture actually looks like. Brother Kevin, let's look at the video. You want me to mic the music for you? You're good with that music? <laughs> okay. That's the very top, missing the capstone. Gives you an idea of how high it is. Those are cars, just to give you an idea, cars, buses off in the distance. Very, very mammoth structure. Let me give you some bare facts. There are 2.3 million blocks 
in the building of the Great Pyramid. It weighs over 6.1 million tons. There are 203 courses when he climbed up, 481 feet high. There are, it covers an area of 13.1 acres with four sides pointed due north, south, east, and west. Now the Paris Observatory is what gets us closest to true north. They're six minutes <coughs> off of true north. Whoever built this pyramid is less than one minute off of true north. They had more understanding of how to find direction than we do today. Uh, there are four corners at 90 degree angles. There is an apex directly under the center of the base. In other words, the apex is directly under the center of the base. And one of the things about the pyramids is, is that the evolutionists say that there's many other pyramids in Egypt, but they're off. A lot of them are crooked, or a lot of them are run down, they're, they're off kilter. And what the evolutionists say is, see, they were building and building and building and building and building and learning how to build the, the pyramid until they finally achieved this, but I don't think so. I'll explain to you what I think happened in just a few moments, but this is a unique, these three pyramids are very, very unique compared to anything else. One of the things that's interesting, did you just read, did we just read Isaiah chapter number 19? Uh -huh. Okay, there's a great book called The Great Pyramid Decoded by Raymond Kapp. That verse, verse number 19, that declares that there will be an altar in the midst of Egypt, in the Hebrew, each of the letters, in the Hebrew of that verse, each of the letters have a numerical denomination associated with it. So if you have the letter A, it has a certain numerical, uh, uh, numerical denomination associated with it. When you add up all of those numerical numbers in that verse, it comes to 5,449. I'll give you one guess at what the height of the pyramid is. 5,449 feet. Wow. It's an interesting building. A very, very interesting building. All right? That's what, if you will. So that gives you just a little bit of an understanding of what's going on. Now, on the left side over here is the base schematic of the pyramid and what we know. Now, there's been recent testings, and we'll see in just a minute, that they found another void right up here in this area where my laser pointer is. There's another void area there. <laughs> That's a void. Oh, okay, no more voids. There's an empty space there. Uh, but what you're looking at right here, and I'll walk you over this here on the right just a minute, but I want you to look right here. This would be the entrance area. Now, I want you to watch for just a minute, because whoever built this had a profound understanding of a lot of different things. And some people believe that it might have even been someone that understood a lot about the Bible. This is the entrance where man enters in, and he immediately begins to go down. Unless you follow that path upward, you will go all the way down into this chamber, and they have not been able to plumb the depths of that. They don't know where that bottom chamber ends up. It's bottomless. So far as we know, they've never been able to find where that chamber is leading. But if instead of going down to the bottomless pit, you take the higher road, eventually you come up into what's called the Grand Gallery. In the Grand Gallery here is the Queen's Chamber. If you keep on going up, that is the King's Chamber. Okay? So up is the way to glory. Down is the way to the bottomless pit. What you're looking at here is that stairway, is that railway going into that main chamber. Now, there are a lot of air shafts, and I'll show you some schematics here in just a moment. But they were doing some research, and they came across, not long ago or a while back, they came across a chamber that had a door, a doorway. What you're looking at right here are two handles. Something was on the other side of that. So they got this little fellow right here, and they decided to try to go back in there and figure out what it was. I'm going to show you a little video here. That's the void we were talking about. We have 
very, very exciting because no one was expecting such a massive thing inside the pyramid. This was not in any kind of theory. energy kind of electron, they are able to move through stones. It most likely has something to do with construction. You need to have some space to manipulate the stone, just into position, but also it could spread the weight of the stone so that it doesn't come crashing down. Okay, now she was wrong about that, but I'll explain why in just a moment. They don't know what that void is, but they sit a machine, a little tiny machine, if you go to the next slide, and they wanted to get in there and see what was in there. Now, again, this is another schematic. We'll come back to that machine in just a few moments, but again, this is another schematic of what you're looking at. For instance, here, there's just so many things about the, the, the pyramid that don't add up to a bunch of guys in togas with elephants and sticks moving stones. Mm -hmm. Long before it ever came about, here's a stone that's hinged for a closure. Again, you can see the underworkings of what they believe are connections. And then here again, you can see the schematic as you're going up into the king's chamber and the queen's chamber. Now, it's very important that you understand what I'm about to say here. This is not a matter of opinion. This is a matter of fact. There is nothing that has ever been discovered that has ever proved that this is a tomb. Right. Nothing. In fact, everything against it says it was not a tomb. Now, have people used it? Certainly. But any of the post writings that have been in there have been after this thing was built. Nothing about this says it was a tomb. There's no writings. There's no Pharaoh. No anything like that. This thing was not designed to be a tomb. We'll talk about what it was designed to be in a little bit, but you have to see that there's a very intricate operation going on inside of this thing. Now, one of the things that's interesting that a lot of people don't understand is that when you look at the tomb and when you look, or when you look at the pyramid, what they claim to be a tomb, there's a profound connection between Egypt and Israel. Look at your Bible again, Exodus chapter number nine, uh, uh, Isaiah chapter number 19. And notice what the Bible says in Isaiah 19, verse 25. Whom the Lord of hosts shall bless, saying, Blessed be Egypt, my people, and Assyria, the work of my hands, and Israel, mine inheritance. Egypt is his people. There's not a commentator anywhere that I know of that can give an adequate answer to what that verse means. But when you look at the schematics, what you're looking at right there is the Ark of the Covenant. And what you're looking at right there is what is called the King's Coffin. When you go into the Great Pyramid, there is this box there with no cover. Granite. And it is an amazing feat of architecture and carpentry itself. Masonry, I should say. That right there alone, that box right there alone is beyond anything that the Egyptians of the time were capable of doing. The edges, the angular. See, the Egyptians had no angular measure measurements at this time. So for them to be able to cut at these angles is far beyond what they should have been able to do. But there was no top. There was no notation here in the king's chamber. There's nothing about a king being buried there. There's just an empty box. Well, guess what fits in there? That's the schematic. That's what the Ark of the Covenant would look like. Let's go to the next slide. That's that box. Now, of course, Tomb Raiders and everybody else have had their go at it. But it's a very interesting box, isn't it? Now, the scientists say, well, that's the tomb where a mummy must have been. But there's no markings in there whatsoever. There's nothing that tells us that it was a tomb. Now, what does that look like to you right there? Does that look like the Ark of the Covenant? Yes. Does that look like a bunch of Jews carrying the Ark of the Covenant? No. That's an Egyptian hieroglyphic. Something was going on. There has been a profound connection. Where did Abraham go? Into Egypt. Where did the children of Israel go? Into Egypt. 
The Bible says that Moses was a mighty man in Egypt. <clears throat> Moses was in line to be a prince in Egypt and maybe even be a pharaoh. There's a profound connection going on. And whoever built that long before this came along, is that the first time we ever see an Ark of the Covenant? Or was there something there before? Next slide. So, what you're going to see here, well, I'll let it play and I'll come back and explain. Go ahead and play. Queen's Chamber, which lays within the Great Pyramid of Khufu, more commonly known as Cheops, has astonished, shocked, and mystified Egyptologists since its mysterious existence was discovered. The intrigue into this elusive chamber, along with its mysterious adjacent shafts, comes as no surprise once one understands the anomalous characteristics of their construction. That's the machine as going in As we have there. already covered before, massive cover-ups have been suspected as taking place surrounding this mysterious chamber since its discovery. Strange shaft tunnels, set at a 45-degree incline, no larger than 20 centimeters in diameter, run away from this room, and no one seems to know why. Not only would these ancient shafts require being hermetically sealed during the pyramid's construction to stop them from becoming blocked, but the excruciating effort that would have gone into making them becomes all the more of a confusing undertaking once you realize they were not even connected to the chamber, but hidden 40 centimeters away from entering the tomb within the walls, completely invisible from the inside of the burial room located deep within the structure. Cheops, noticeably being the only pyramid to have ever been constructed with such shafts, making their addition a popular mystery within Egyptian history. One leads out from the subterranean chamber, two lead out from a termination point some 40 centimeters from the wall of the so-called Queen's Chamber, or now popularly suspected to be that of an alien tomb among ancient alien specialists, and two from the King's Chamber above. Here is where our story becomes interesting. Rudolf Gantenbrecht, famous for actually discovering the blocking door within one of the Queen's chamber shafts, which could lead to an as yet undisclosed tomb, has also made other curious discoveries within the Great Pyramid. Discoveries which could only be explained by modern covert explorations of tunnels that were supposedly to that point unexplored. Ganton Brick's cache being but one example of these mysterious finds, deep within the tunnel systems in the royal chamber, at a 90 degree turn going vertically upwards, a pile of papers, possibly wrapped artifacts, weighed down with a small piece of timber or stone, possibly another artifact, was discovered by Ganton Brick's robot. Also, during initial location attempts to find access tunnels leading to the Queen's chamber, Several blocking stones required removal. After the removal of the seventh block, a modern era hexagonal steel rods were discovered discarded upon the tunnel's floor. Each section of the hexagonal steel rods measures 2.7 meters in length and was fitted with a round socket, which allowed them to be joined to the next section. In one of the lower shafts in 1872, Wayman Dixon found three more objects which could be considered proof of prior covert exploration of the mysterious northern shafts. A copper grappling hook, about five centimeters in length, accompanied by a small gray-green stone ball and a broken off piece of a square wooden slat or rod, about 13 centimeters long. The wood would today be the most intriguing of his finds. These artifacts suspected to be remnants of the grave robber's tools, could have been carbon dated Yet this fragment is the only one of the three to now be missing out of the London Museum's collection. Unfortunately, in his writings, Dixon doesn't say in which of the two lower shafts he actually found the objects, but he mentions them in connection with the northern one. Not only did these obviously highly intelligent people leave evidence of how they must have gotten in, but also traces upon the previous untouched ancient walls of the shafts within Cheops clearly left by their previous robotic technologies. Other square metal rods have been recovered, along with other artifacts discarded within some tunnel systems deep within the ancient structures, meaning these guys got to the treasures way before we did. Interestingly, reported evidence of covert excavations continues to this day. Heavy-duty electrical supplies discreetly running into 
and trailing deep into the pyramids have been noticed and photographed by some of the more astute tourists. Witnesses to the sounds of heavy machinery being used beneath the site is also frequently reported, yet rarely followed up. It seems it's not a question of whether brilliant minds have achieved the seemingly impossible in penetrating these secret layers, but more a question of how and what astonishing finds have possibly been kept concealed. There's something in there that they want, that they're looking for. Those tunnels, what's fascinating about those shaft tunnels, is that they were not designed to be seen. They were discovered, but you could see that they were covered up in there. There's been a lot of reports lately of them trying to get at that void in there. They believe that there's something in there that they're looking for and that they do a lot of covert excavation trying to find out what's in that tomb, uh, what's in that, that pyramid, which they've called a tomb. Now, when you and I read about it, we think, hey, we know all that there is to know about it. But we've only scratched the surface. We haven't even gotten at the subterranean what's underneath of these tombs. And a lot of people believe that there's an interconnection underneath uh, source that connects it both with the other two, with the other pyramids, and with the Sphinx. Next slide. So, let me give you a little bit more information to let you see how odd this thing is. The base length is three three hundred sixty-five point two four two two. That is the exact number of the days in the solar year. Whoever built it built it where the base length is not three hundred sixty-four, not three hundred sixty-six not 365, but is measured at 365.2422. When twice the length of the baseline is divided by the height, we get the number pi. 5,000 years ago, that should not be known by the Egyptians. But whoever built that knew about pi. And what's the magical thing about pi? <coughs> it's never, ending. never ending. What is it called? It's a divine number. It never ends. Whoever built this, built that, that pyramid based upon something that was not to be discovered for another 3,000 years. Every 10 feet up the slope of the pyramid, you rise 9 feet in altitude. By multiplying the altitude of the pyramid by 10 to the 9th power, you get this number right here, which is the distance from the earth to the sun. The four cornerstones lay at true east, west, north, and south. So when the sun crosses the equinox, no shadow is cast anywhere on all sides of it. In other words, it is a brilliant, brilliant piece of architecture that we'd have a hard time doing today with all of our technology. But you're told that whoever built that was guys in togas with rocks, pulleys, sand, and a whole lot of time on their hands. Next slide. So... Pyramid positioning in the world is very unique. It is at the center of the land, known habitable land masses in the world. Whoever built this great pyramid knew that it was at the center of the habitable land masses. You can see it there and again there. Next one. Also, the Great Pyramid goes, and I'm not going to get into these details here, but the, uh, but the equator. Here, whoever built the pyramid understood the mathematical concept of how to square the circle. The Bible actually talks about the foundations of the earth. And so you can see that there is a profound, profound uh, understanding of mathematics, geography going on. Now, what's really fascinating is this particular slide. The Great Pyramid is positioned in a way that is far beyond what they should have astronomically known. Their astrology was amazing. Their positioning in time, their positioning in the equinox and the stars was beyond anything that they should have known. And what's really fascinating about it is, one of the things that stands out is that everything about that is designed for a circular plane and a domed atmosphere. Circular plane, a domed atmosphere. Circular plane, domed atmosphere. I have people ask me all the time, Preacher, what do you believe about the nature of the earth? I believe exactly what David in the Bible believed. Next slide. So what is that, Preacher? You have to read the Bible. All right. For those of you that are in medicine, 
One of the things that's very interesting is the pituitary gland and this penile gland. There's a guy by the name of Hunter Thompson. Have you ever heard of DMT, uh, the drug DMT? There is a guy by the name of Hunter Thompson. There's a whole world of cult and story behind DMT. But when you start looking at this diagram, you'll find that that pyramid matches up to a lot of different things that are out there. Next slide, if you will. Now, the question is, what are they, what is the Great Pyramid doing? What is its design? Well, we know it's not a tomb. Nobody has ever been entombed in there. There's no hieroglyphics of any tomb. There's no chamber that shows any tomb. So what was it? Some people believe that it was a stargate in the sense of, uh, it was a stargate in the sense of opening a doorway to another world, able to get to another world. What's fascinating about it is, is that the pharaohs believed that when they died, they were going to journey to the stars, out into the stars. Have you ever seen the movie years ago that came out with Kurt Russell and Stargate and the Egyptian connection that they have there? Some people believe that the energy, they were somehow able to open up a Stargate, which is sort of interesting, although you have this global pyramidic thing going on. Some people believe that it was burial markers for the underworld. Now, before the flood, there were two kinds of groups on this earth. There were angelic beings, sons of God, but there were also demigods. Some people believe that these pyramids were the burial markers for those Herculean demigods. Other people believe that it was a way in which you were able to communicate interdimensionally. Now, we're going to go off on the deep end here for just a minute. Can you, can you go with me for just a second? Okay. So, there is a book called The Stargate Conspiracy. I'm not going to get into all the details of it. I'm not going to read in the great details of it. But... The Stargate Conspiracy talks about a true story. How many of you ever heard, uh, I've watched Star Trek, Gene Roddenberry. There was a cult, and it has been around for years and years and years and years, that believed that they were able to communicate with a group of interdimensional beings, and Gene Roddenberry is one of them. I mean, have you ever been amazed at how cutting edge Star Trek was? The ability to flip phone? the touch pads, all the different things, the Federation, One World Federation. Well, Gene Roddenberry and these other guys were part of a cult that believed that they were in contact with a group that called themselves the Nine. The Nine. The Nine said that they were interdimensional beings from another dimension. And they were the ones that gave the Egyptians and others the ability and understanding to know how to build these because it was in these places where they were able to meet and to communicate. Now what's fascinating about that terminology, the nine, is that in Exodus chapter number 12, the Bible said that he would judge the nation of Egypt when the death angel came over, but he also said he would judge who? The gods. Grab your Bible real quick, turn to the book of Exodus. I think it's Exodus chapter 12, verse 12. We'll look at it real quick. Very, very quickly. Exodus chapter 12. Is it verse 12? Yes, sir. Somebody read it out. Give me a man to read it out good and strong. Exodus chapter 12, verse 12. For I will pass through the land of Egypt this night and will slay all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt, both lower deep. I will execute judgment, I am the Lord. He said, I'm going to judge those gods too. Do you know how many gods, the major gods of Egypt were? I'll give you one number. Nine. How many plagues were there? Nine. Nine. That interdimensional group might be more than you realize. Have you ever seen or wondered or seen on the internet uh, the Simpsons and how they have been so predictive of a lot of things that have gone on? Yeah. Donald Trump and other stuff like that. How are these TV shows? There might be more interdimensional communication going on than you believe. Uh... Herodotus Siculus Herodotus wrote this. That's a, that's a big mouthful, isn't it? But he wrote this about way back in the time. This was around, oh, let's see here. Uh, let's see, about 400 B.C. He wrote, at first, gods and heroes, heroes ruled Egypt for a little less than 18,000 years. The last of the gods to rule being Horus, the son of Isis. Mortals have been kings of their countries, they say, for a little less than 5,000 years. In other words, what that historian believed is that before men came along, there were gods that were ruling. 
You've got nine gods, nine plagues, the cult of nine. Some people believe that the reason why there is a global pyramidic architectural unity is because globally the god of this world, small g, is communicating with these different people. Next slide, if you will. Now, some people believe that it's a little bit more. Some people believe that what you're actually seeing is a pre-flood power grid. The reason that you're seeing, and now, now follow the thinking, before the flood, there was a pre-flood power grid with these architectural structures. After the flood, without the technology, man being reduced more to a base system, they come back to these things, and what do they do? Well, uh, Clark wrote, uh, uh, he wrote Childhoods in Arthur C. Clark. He made the statement that if you have technology, advanced technology, it would seem like magic to somebody. So you come back after the flood and you have no technological ability, but you have these vast buildings. What are they going to do? They're going to worship those buildings. They're going to use those buildings as sacred forms of worship. And so it will be handed on generation after generation after generation that this is a house of worship. But what if they were designed to do something else? What if prior to the flood, as we think the Bible teaches, there was a panacea? There was not divided continents, but one continent. And on this continent, there was a power grid that tapped into the natural resources that God had placed in our grasp. Well, Tesla believed that that, and part of what you, if you use a cell phone, you ought to tip your hat to Nikola Tesla. He was a brilliant, brilliant, brilliant man, far ahead. And so he believed that there was an ability to tap in. And he actually built a tower trying to do that, tap into the free energy. Let's show you a quick video. It's, it's about a minute and a half, a little bit more, but I think it'll, it'll tie in with what we're doing here. Brother Kevin. It is believed that in the distant past, a device of excellent electric conductivity was located at the top of the pyramid, where today an empty space remains, and was believed to be made from gold. Gold could have created a conductive path for energy to be directed upwards, directing it high into the ionosphere. The pyramid's geographical location magnifies the electromagnetic forces on the planet, where telluric currents are at their strongest. Interestingly, traces of this long-lost ancient technology were rediscovered in the 1900s by the great Nikola Tesla. Tesla discovered how to transmit electricity naturally to a light bulb he held in his hand. Tesla claimed that he had perfected the method of harnessing and transmitting free wireless energy using the Earth's electromagnetic field. Located at the Warden Club Tower that Tesla built between 1901 and 1917, Tesla applied a nearly identical form of this ancient technology used in Egypt over 4,000 years ago. Tesla's tower was also believed to have been built upon aquifers, which means that the electric technology used by Tesla is nearly identical to that applied in the construction of the Great Pyramid. Both the Great Pyramid of Giza and Tesla's magnificent Warden Club Tower were systems that generated negative ions and were capable of transmitting them without the need for electric cables. A completely free and wireless energy that powered other electrical components through vast distances. It appears that the ancient Egyptians were not the only ones to have understood the benefits of this ancient technology. Okay, so we're going to stop there. Do you understand what they're getting at when they're, when they're making that? What they're talking about is the possibility that these pyramidic structures were actually power plants, that they were designed to be used and that they were left, they're not saying it, but I believe that it's possible, that they were leftover technology pre-flood. Now when you think about before the flood, you tend to watch TV and you think about guys in togas with a wooden mallet walking around trying to build a boat in their backyard, but that's not what they were. The average lifespan of a man or a woman prior to the flood was 800 years. Now in 200 years, 1776 to 1976, man was able to fake a moon landing. <laughs> in 200 years. In 200 years, man was able to go from riding a horse, sending a telegraph, to talking on the phone instantaneously video in 200 years. And that was based on prior technology. What do you think a man was able to accomplish if he could live 800 years? Minimal sickness, minimal damage, minimal ecological problems whatsoever. Imagine what he was able to accomplish. Now, Nikola Tesla, much of his discovery, there's a whole other 
thing that I could do. And you'd have to just come over to the house and I'd have to tell you the story about him. But he was railroaded out. He is the real source of what you and I have today. He was railroaded out and I believe he was right. I believe that God created this world to be self-sustaining. I don't believe that oil is a scarcity product. I believe that oil is an abiotic product of this earth. You don't have enough dead dinosaurs to yeah. produce the amount Amen. of oil we get. <laughs> but you can't charge three bucks a gallon unless you put scarcity on it. Mm -hmm. The earth naturally produces that stuff. And electricity is the same thing. Oh, and by the way, electricity is profoundly connected with the spirit world. Because Jesus said, I saw Satan as lightning when he was thrown out of the sky. And the fact of the matter is, the Bible says that the angels or, or a cherubim-like being in the book of Ezekiel flashes like lightning when you see it. The Bible says the voice of the Lord is like thunder. There's something profoundly connected there. And so when you're looking at this thing and you're seeing, man, we've got Egyptians holding light bulbs here and lighting up stuff, it's kind of hard to explain. Now... What's really fascinating is there's a great book by Graham Hancock called Fingerprints, uh, uh, Fingerprints of the Gods. Lest you want to believe that, again, this was just something that was built, I want you to listen to this statement very, very closely. At present, there are only, at present, there are only two land-based cranes in the world that could lift weights of this magnitude. Talking about the stones. There are only two land-based cranes that can lift these stones. At very frontiers of construction technology, these are both vast, industrialized machines with booms reaching more than 220 feet into the air, which require onboard counterweights of 160 tons to prevent them from tipping over. The preparation time for a single lift, just one stone, a single lift, is around six weeks and calls for the skills of specialized teams up to 20 men to lift one stone, the weight of which the pyramid was built. How did the pyramid get built? You mean to tell me a king, a pharaoh with a bunch of time on his hands said, I want to be buried in that? Or is there something more going on? I think there's something more going on. Now what you're looking at here is what the pyramid originally looked like. Remember we saw the video of the guy climbing up the stones? That's the underneath. We know from historical documents that it was covered in white limestone. Smooth. You couldn't climb up it. It was smooth. And we know that at the top, it had what they believed was a golden headstone. Jesus is the chief what? Cornerstone. Cornerstone. Right. That's what you would have seen. See those steps right there? And the covering of white. Scientists have said that if that is exactly what it was, and we believe it was from documentation, that it would have been visible from the moon once the sun hit it. It would have lit up like a beautiful star. Next one. The blocks, as I just said, range anywhere from 30 to 80 tons and would have had to been lifted nearly 500 feet during construction. Many of the materials used in the construction originate 500 miles away. Now, it's very important when somebody says, hey, 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 they, they probably did it right there. That's fine. It's one thing. Even if you want to say, well, I believe they managed to build there. And they didn't get the stones there. They had to quarry that 500-ton stone, that 200-ton stone, and they had to take it 500 miles before they ever got it up. Huh? That's bigger than what you think. Next one. So, some people believe that it's alien technology. That's a lot, that's a lot of people believe that. So, but you don't believe that little green men are involved in that. No, they're gray. And, but, um, <laughs> some people believe it's alien technology. I don't believe that it is alien, but I do believe it is extraterrestrial. Some people believe that it was the Nephilim of the giants. You see the great moss, the, 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 the great obelisk here? Now, listen to me very closely for just a second. Let's assume that just because they were Egyptians, they weren't stupid. Let's assume that. And if you're going to draw things and depict events that are going on, let's assume that you have some sense of proportional size. Why are they drawing giants? Sometimes you could argue, well, it's to show how powerful they are. That's a possibility. 
but it is a consistent thing. Here's a picture of the great obelisk. Here's a picture of who they believe were building it, the Egyptians. That size, someone that size is setting it up where they want it to be. What were they showing us? Maybe they were showing us exactly what was going on. The Bible says there were giants in those days. Next slide. Maybe they are indeed showing us what's going on. Notice the pyramid builders. A giraffe. That's a pretty big guy up next to a giraffe. Yeah. The gods that they depict. You see that Pharaoh in the middle, that human right there where the red dot is? These are the gods that that human worshipped. So when the Bible says that the Israelis, the Jews, in the promised land were scared because they appeared to be in the eyes as grasshoppers, is that biblical hyperbole? Were they exaggerating? Or does archaeology testify to the truth of the Bible? Yeah, that's right. Evidence staring us in the face, Patrick Heron, who is by no means a Bible believer per se, he says, evidence staring us in the face suggests that an incredibly advanced civilization of beings with a fascination for astronomical matters, we just talked about that, didn't we? And possessing great strength, well, that would help you in build, and mathematical abilities were the builders. I submit to you that the sons of God qualify for each one of those. Mm -hmm. They came from the stars. They would have known about that. They had great strength. That's why closer and closer we get to the Lord, the more and more and more you're going to see DC and Marvel movies. They're prepping this world That's right. for the gods. There's a great book called Our Gods Wear Spandex. <laughs> Go and read that. All right, next slide if you will. Only one group can qualify as potential candidates. The primeval gods of prehistory. A cast of sophisticated, super intelligent, supernatural beings. Men who were of a divine background and whose former abode was of celestial nature. Spirit men who in the course of ancient time changed and became wicked and evil. Does that sound like anything you come across in the Bible? Mm -hmm. These are the architects and builders, the founders of the religious rites and the original high priest of Egyptian antiquity. And that's why your Egyptians, when they wanted to pick their gods, there's humans, mm -hmm. there's their gods. There's him, and there's the, there's the humans, there's their gods. If it's once or twice, it's coincidence. But over and over and over, they're telling you something. And it isn't what humanism says. They're saying, this is who we were worshiping. And your Bible tells you that in Genesis 6. Everyone still with me? Mm -hmm. The pyramid text says, this is very interesting. Very, very interesting. The pyramid text says, this is a quote from one of the pyramid texts. Thy sister Isis cometh unto thee, rejoicing in her love for thee. Thou wettest her upon thee, thy issue entereth into her, and she becometh great with child, the star Sept, which is Sirius, the dog star. Horus, Sept, cometh forth from thee in the form of Horus, dweller. There are two stars there, but you can't know that by eyesight. The only way that you can know that there are two stars in that system is you have to have a super high-powered telescope to be able to figure that out. But whoever wrote that text in Egyptian knew. Graham Hancock in his book, Fingerprints of the Gods, said, how could the scribes who wrote the pyramid text possibly obtain the information that Sirius was two stars, not one? When you look up in the sky and you see it, you think it's one, unless you have a very, very powerful telescope. Did the Egyptians have a very powerful telescope? Or were the Egyptians worshiping somebody who had been to that star, who knew what the stars were like, and was telling them, and maybe even writing the text for them. If Satan is the great imitator, and God has a church, does Satan have a church? Yeah. If God has scriptures, does Satan write scriptures? Yeah. Maybe he does. Next one, if you will. Very, very quickly, just a couple of ones. Much of this, we won't get into it, but you'll find, I'm just going to, I'm not even going to go into reading all this, but you'll find here, Egyptian God carrying that, here's the same thing in the Catholic relic. There's a profound connection going on. I'm not going to get into this, I already did just a little bit. There are your nine gods, Ra, Shuk, Tefnut, Gib, Nut, Osiris, Isis, Nephthys, and Set. 
These were the gods. And before you ever even realized it, God already told you about it in Exodus 12, 12, that he was going to judge. Next one, if you will. Let me just give you this. Links to prophecy. You ready? We're going to go through it real quick. The pyramid, 6,000-inch baseline, projects 6,000 years of man's history and looks toward the millennium, the Lord's day. Its baseline is 6,000. The empty king's chamber signifies the empty tomb of Jesus, and the queen's chamber refers to the mansion in New Jerusalem. The limestones that covered the, limestones that covered the pyramid, well, there were 144,000 of them. Does that number sound familiar? The missing cornerstone refers to Jesus, who will be the head of the New Jerusalem. That's one. Now, how many of you know about New Jerusalem in Revelation? What is it, Revelation chapter 21? You know what I'm talking about? I saw New Jerusalem coming down. And what is unique about it is it's 1,500 miles wide, 1,500 miles long, 1,500 miles high. It will sit dead center, the Bible says, over the land of Israel. Next one, if you will. Now, when we think of New Jerusalem because of the schematics, that's usually what we think of. And it's a very, very interesting slide on your own. You ought to study it sometime. I'll be glad to send you the link. But there's New Jerusalem coming down out of heaven, 1,500 miles long, 1,500 miles wide, and 1,500 miles high. That's pretty big. That's like half the continent of the United States of America, and then turn it up on its end, and it's going that far up into the air, if it even actually touches. Some Bible scholars, and I happen to believe be one of them, not that I'm a Bible scholar, believe that it will actually orbit the circular plane of the earth. But notice that you've got this new Jerusalem here coming down. Next one. Well, that's not the only thing that can do that. That can be that way, a cube, but that one is 1,500 miles long, 1,500 miles wide, and it can also be 1,500 miles high. Now, if all the world is looking pyramidically, do you think New Jerusalem is going to look like that? Or do you think New Jerusalem is going to look like that? Yeah. I think she's going to look like that. With the chief cornerstone and all the building, Paul said, fitly framed together. Maybe before the flood, one of the reasons why all of them were building this same design is they knew something we didn't. They understood something we didn't. Next slide, if you will. The Bible says in that day there shall be an altar in the midst of the land of Egypt. There's something very peculiar about that. Next one. And I think what you're going to see is something like that. And that Egyptian... Now remember, when does, the, when does this New Jerusalem come down? During the millennium? Yeah. No. New Jerusalem comes down at the end of the thousand years when God creates a new heaven and a new earth. For a thousand years, I believe that that, <clears throat> that pyramid in Egypt will testify to God's glory. But like a shadow and a tide, at the end of that millennium, when the new heaven and the new earth, then we're going to get the real deal. The pyramid, I believe, is one of the strangest and yet most divine pieces of architecture on the face of this earth. My fundamental belief is that it's part of technology that made its way through the flood, and when people came off of the boat and they began to populate and to procreate, they no longer have the technology to use these buildings, but it doesn't matter whether it's in Pichu Cuchu, it doesn't matter whether it's in the Aztecs or the Incas, it doesn't matter where it is, all around the world, they're worshiping the same thing. They knew there was something special about these buildings, but they didn't have the technology to go with it. And there, God left himself an altar, and he says, that points to me. And I think it is pointing. There's a lot more that your Bible tells you about the world going on. Don't just believe Nova. Don't just believe the History Channel. Believe your Bible. There's a lot more to this whole thing. Amen? Amen. That's my presentation. Let's stand. We'll be dismissed. And I'll be well. Don't clap. Don't clap. Don't clap. Give. I know how to do it. <laughs> Right, I'll be up here for questions if you have them, but this is the one thing I want you to take away. Really, really if you'll hit the lights, this is the one thing I want you to take away. Your Bible gives you far more insight on this stuff than you could ever imagine. If you have a King James Bible, you are cutting edge.
it's telling you about this already long before this stuff ever came along. Amen? All right, Brother Rich, lift your voice, dismiss us in a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for this night, Lord. And as Pastor said, we do thank you for the blessed word of God that gives us so much insight, Lord. And we just pray as we leave tonight, Father, that we would um, just read the word of God and absorb the word of God and may it bless our lives. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. God bless you.